Welcome to Victory Christian Center. You're about to hear from our senior pastor, Pastor Stefan Schlugel, as he brings a message on a Sunday service. And, uh, you know, last week we talked about the fundamentals. If you like, we laid a foundation. Today we're going to put up some walls, okay? A typical building would have four walls, uh, and we're talking about load-bearing walls. There could be internal walls, but we really were just dealing with the main parts. Um, and, you know, the reason why we do that is because when I, when Pastor Vanessa and I learned about faith, you know, if, if, if it's a, a 52-point sermon, we forget most of them, but everybody can remember four points. All right? Uh, and so I want to hit those four headlines. Uh, and for some of you, it'll be a reminder of things that you've already heard before, but it's always good to brush up. And I always know where faith people are, because when faith people hear a message again, they're excited again. When somebody says, oh, I heard that before, and they get bored, I know immediately they're not people of faith. All right? Because our faith needs to be constantly brushed up on and constantly renewed and constantly fed. And uh, as I say, you know, Pastor Vanessa and I have learned a few things about faith, but we don't know everything about faith yet necessarily. And we need to be reminded about these concepts over and over so that we can be on the cutting edge of faith. Have you know that... Uh, for those of you that are working in the kitchen at home, you've got some kitchen knives there, and, and you know, some, some of you got some really good ones, and some of you like, you know, average, but you know, you can even put a, a sharp edge on an average knife uh, and make it sharp, but you know, you can have a really good knife, and you let it go blunt, and then it doesn't, no longer cuts like it should, and our faith needs to be on the cutting edge. Um, so with that, um, uh, as I said, we're talking about those four pillars of faith, and I'm going to swing it to the first one here and uh, read again from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And just as we read, I want to pray, and I'd also like to welcome our internet audience at this point in time and want to say welcome. God bless you. We're thrilled that you were able to join us, whether this is for our live stream that is going on right now or whether you will pull up that message at a later stage. We trust that this will bless you. The outline can be found on that link below your screen. Uh, please help yourself and God bless you. All right, here we go. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says, And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that God exists and that He is a rewarder of those who sincerely seek Him. Father, we thank You again for Your Word today. We thank You, Lord, that Your Word is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. I thank you, Lord God, that it pierces our heart. I thank you, Lord, that it cuts away things in our lives that are not supposed to be there. That, Lord, it confronts lies and deceptions, but yet it builds our faith and it builds us up and it brings fresh revelation into our hearts. And so, Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're present right now, that by the power of your Spirit, Lord, you open the eyes of our understanding. You're showing us things that we've never seen before, and a fresh revelation comes into every heart that is, uh, Lord, listening to this message today. In Jesus' name, amen. Notice the three words here, and we've looked at the scripture last week. I want to pick up some, on some other words in this thing here, uh, in this verse. Um, and notice the three words, faith must believe. He who comes to God must believe, all right? And the first pillar of faith is this, that faith must believe. Now, I know that this is very obvious, um, but you know, sometimes people miss the obvious, um, and, and so that's why we go right, right back to grounds here and we start from the ground up. And the first pillar of faith is that faith must believe. 
somewhere, if I'm w- wanting to walk by faith, I must be leaning the way of faith and away from doubt and unbelief. Uh, some may I make a decision and say, no, I will no longer doubt God's word. No, I will no longer listen to the devil that started his lies way back in the Garden of Eden uh, when he spoke to Eve and, and Eve said, you know, God said this and God said that. And the, and the devil says, has God said? Has God said? And, and actually, you know, so the whole sowing of doubt, uh, I no longer allow that to go on in my life. I will no longer oscillate back and forth between a position of faith and then coming out of faith and back into doubt. The Bible says, let us not be double-minded, for a double-minded needs to know that he cannot receive anything from the Lord because of his double-mindedness, of his oscillating back and forth, back and forth, position of faith. It's true. Oh, it's not true. Oh, maybe it's true. And faith says, yes, it's true. The written word of God is true. God has spoken it. And he will make it good. So faith must believe. You see, uh, a faith that does not believe is not faith. Because faith believes. Water that is not wet is not water. Okay? Water is wet. And faith believes. Having faith and believing is the same thing. One's the subject, the other one's the noun. All right, this is not supposed to be an English lesson as such, but I'm just stating the obvious to solidify that whole area in our lives. You know, many Christians hope that God's promises will come to pass in their lives. But friends, our our hopes and dreams will not materialize through hope alone. It is faith that gives substance to our hopes. Hopes are only mental pictures. Dreams a pictures, moving pictures, moving uh, uh, in like a movie, if you like, if you close your eyes and you imagine things. But when you add faith, then you can bring reality to the things that you imagine as you read the Word of God. And a sick person reading the Word of God and see that healing is available by faith. And that becomes an imagination. That becomes a hope. It becomes a dream. But it's only a hope, and it's not until our faith reaches out and lays a hold of the power of God in this area that healing materializes, manifests in our lives. Romans chapter 4 verse 3 says, So what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. All right? Abraham believed God. Now, we need to realize that Abraham wasn't in a church. We need to realize that there was no church. God appeared to Abraham and called him out of Ur of the Chaldeans. And and God says to him, Abraham, leave your country, leave your family to a place that I will show you. And I will give you land and, and, and all the other things that God has promised. And then one day, Abraham had an encounter with a, with a priest of God called Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek uh, is a, a, a high priest after the, you know, like is, is, a, is, a, is a type of Jesus Christ. So, in a sense, we could say that, that Abraham had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And then one day, God spoke to Abraham and he says, Abraham, I am your shield and I'm your exceedingly great reward. And you know, what I've done is I've taken that scripture and I've made that mine. And I say, God is my shield. God's my protection. And he's my exceedingly great reward. But anyway, that was just as an aside. And then Abraham turns around and says, okay, God. But actually, God, what are you going to give me seeing I go childless? And the heir of all the wealth that I have is going to one of my servants. And God says, no, this man is not going to be an heir. One coming forth from your own body is going to be your heir. And then God says, if you lift up your eyes and look at all the stars that you can see in heaven, he says, this is how many descendants you're going to have. So God gave him a mental picture, if you like, a picture to meditate on 
when Abraham went outside in the evening, you know, when things had got quiet and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, activity has stopped because daylight was gone and people are settling down and people are just interacting as families. You know, servants are doing their thing over there. Abraham over here, uh, um, Sarah in the tent. It was a bit lonely in there because there's no kids in there. And, you know, uh, Sarah was a barren woman and, and, and somehow they, they haven't had children. And, uh, and so God speaks to Abraham and, and he says, Abraham, lift up your eyes. You know what you and I need to do in order to walk by faith? We need to lift up our eyes. We need to look above our presence circumstances and get a vision. We need to look above. We need to, we need to read the, the Word of God and allow it to paint a hope in our lives that faith wants to give substance to. But as I say, we need to get hope and faith working together. And as Abraham looked up and uh, looked at all of that, you know, you can't imagine that's a huge step. Like you've got no kids, no, none, no children. And, and, and he looks up and says, gosh, you know, like it's a big step from where he was to where he is, uh, uh, where God wanted him to be. And yet the Bible says that he believed God. He took faith and he believed God. And the Bible says here that it was accounted unto him for righteousness. His believing was accounted unto him for righteousness. So not only, not only did God say, okay, because you believed it, there's going to be a son in your life, and then he's going to have a son, and that will become the starting point that you will indeed be the father of many nations. But not only did God say, because you believe that's going to happen, but he uh, accounted it to him for righteousness. So if you like, uh, Abraham was justified by faith, just as you and I are, we have faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. All right? So it was accounted to him, for righteousness. So God pointed to the stars, and the Bible says that Abraham believed. And in Romans chapter 4, verse 9, when Apostle Paul spoke about Abraham, and he said that, he's, that Abraham is the father of all them that believe. You see, Abraham is just as an aside, Abraham had a, a natural seed called the Jewish nation. But Abraham also had a spiritual seed, and that is all believers, including you and me. All right? So he got natural children, and he got spiritual children. In a sense, you know, on another day, God says, you're going to have as many children as the sand on the seashore. You know, like the sand on the seashore, if you like, uh, it was the Jewish nation, and looking up and all the stars, that was all the Christians. All right? So natural seed, spiritual seed. Um, and, and the Bible says that, uh, that uh, in Romans chapter 4, verse 9, we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. So what that means is that Abraham heard the word and faith came into his heart and with it he believed. How do I get faith? Exactly the same way. I hear the word. People get born again, they receive the measure of faith, and then they hear the promises of God. Faith comes into their hearts, and then with it we believe. Genesis 15, verse 6 says that Abraham believed in God, and Romans chapter 4, verse 3 says that Abraham believed God. So not only did Abraham believe in God and his existence, but he believed God when God spoke the word. And real Bible faith does the same. Real Bible faith not only believes in the existence of God, but it also believes that the written word of God is indeed the God-breathed word, that these are indeed the promises of God that God had spoken forth through his apostles, through his prophets, and, and, and so forth. All right, so real Bible faith does both. So what, does do, what is the first pillar then of faith? The first pillar is that faith must believe. And belief, believing is as much a decision as it is the result of hearing the word and allowing faith to come. Somewhere, I can't stand back and be a skeptic forever. You know, when people first hear this thing about, you know, Jesus Christ and, you know, his sacrificial death on the cross and just the whole thing. You know, initially people can stand back and, you know, and then have a bit of a 
analyze this thing and try to reason it through and everything else. But at a certain point, I got to make a decision and say, I believe. I am going to be or I am a believer. I'm not a doubter. And as I said, when Pastor Vanessa and I grew up in a faith environment, we would always tell ourselves that we were believers. We're not doubters. All right, we're not the doubters. There are people that doubt, but we're not them. We've made a decision. We're going to step over on the side of faith, and we will indeed walk by faith and not by sight. We will no longer allow our natural senses uh, to rob us of faith just because the Word says this and, and, and our circumstances say that. You know, it would have been easy enough for Abraham to say, okay, God, what are you going to give me? And God says, look at all the stars. That's how many children you're going to have. You're going to be the father of many nations. And Abraham could have turned around, looked at his tent and said, God, my tent's empty. That was the circumstance. That was the situation that he was dealing with. But he believed God. He somehow had a... a, a, a a type of surrender to God and say, okay, God, uh, I believe you. If I look at my circumstances, it's like near impossible. It's impossible in the sense that Sarah is a barren woman, and at a certain stage, she got beyond childbearing age anyway. But you know, God's not limited by that because our God is a supernatural God. Our God is able to make a way where there is no way. Our God is able to make good His word. So long as somebody believes. So first pillar of faith is that faith must believe. Second pillar of faith is that faith must speak. Friend, let me tell you that there is no such thing as silent faith. Okay? No such thing. I remember many years ago, I was working in a particular, in a diplomatic uh, environment. A uh, few things went down, and I don't want to go into the detail, but the diplomats required uh, police protection um, 24 hours a day, which meant that there was, uh, I believe, two shifts or, or three shifts of uh, policemen coming, being on the premises there and making sure that if there were any, any problems, you know, they were right there to deal with it. Uh, diplomatic protection squad, I suppose, uh, they will call them. And because uh, I was working in this environment and, and every 12 hours, another policeman turn up and I would, you know, sort of try to, you know, uh, make them feel as welcome as I could. I was working on staff there and, uh, you know, serve them coffee or whatever I did. And I tried to reach out to them. And I got speaking to this one man. And uh, as I talked to him about, you know, the things of the Lord and sort of ease my way into the, uh, into the conversation as we, as we do, he says, oh, I never talk about my, my, my faith. He says, never, never talk about it. Uh, and immediately I knew that the man had no faith. Sometimes people are very quiet and very precious about what they believe to be faith, but there's no such thing as quiet faith or silent faith. You see, God, if we look at the whole situation, God is a spirit. In fact, God is a speaking spirit. And when God spoke at the time of creation, He spoke. He's a speaking spirit. And when He created you and me, you and I, we're also speaking spirits. We speak our faith. We emulate God. We copy the way that God operates. And God prophesies. And then if you look through the prophecies, even about Jesus Christ that came 2,000 years ago, well, God sp- started speaking about Jesus Christ uh, five, 6,000 years ago. And another prophet, the seed of the woman is going to come to crush the seed of Satan and prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. And in the fullness of time, Galatians tell, tells us that God's son was born. What was God doing? God was operating by faith. He released his faith into the earth, and next minute he sent his son. So, there, so there's a, an aspect there where you and I learn from the way that God operates and God speaks. Now, Romans chapter 10, verse 10, speaks about uh, Paul, the apostle, explaining how people get saved. Uh, He says, faith comes by hearing. Um, And then he says in uh, chapter 10, verse 10, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So it's with the heart man believes and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. 
I'm pleased to read that scripture because it tells me that faith is of the heart. Faith is not of the head. Faith is of the heart. So if I get a few thoughts of doubt in my head, <laughs> it's no big deal. I just don't entertain them. I don't start dwelling on them. So a few thoughts, you know, like uh, uh, I say that the devil's fiery darts are thoughts that he fires at our mind and tries to get us to, you know, take the bait as it were and start meditating on it. And whatever the devil gives us or whatever we put into our mind, if we meditate on it long enough, it will eventually sift down and filter into our heart. But, so, but faith is of the heart. And that's why when we first read the word, you know, it, it sort of hits our head, it hits our mind, but we speak it, we meditate on it, it drops into our heart, and it becomes revelation. It becomes spiritual food. It feeds our spirit. It feeds our faith. All right? Um, so with the heart, man believes and is justified. And with your mouth, it is that you confess your faith and are saved. So real Bible faith engages our mouth to speak words of faith. That's why I said there's no such thing as silent faith. You know, the reality is this, that when we say the first pillar, that faith believes, it's only one pillar. Believing alone is not enough. Number two, faith also speaks. Yes, faith believes, but number two, faith speaks. And a person cannot get saved by just believing in their heart. They must confess with their mouth. And then, you know, if I were to ask somebody, say, when did you get saved? Well, you know, they might say, you know, I, I believed, uh, you know, when I heard the gospel say, you know, so 15 years ago, but it was not until, you know, say 10 years ago that I actually confessed Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And salvation comes at the point of confession, not just at the point of believing. And sometimes people sit on their faith, as it were. They've heard the gospel. They don't do anything with it. They believe, yet they have not confessed. But real Bible faith starts speaking uh, and starts to profess uh, what it believes. You see, uh, once again, believing alone is not enough. We must speak our faith with our mouth and declare what we believe, and it is at that moment that the miracle is initiated and we are made the righteousness of God in Christ. God reaches in there. He takes out the old spirit. It says, all things have passed away. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, and it says, all things are become new. All right, so uh, the important part, pillar number two uh, in our uh, four pillars of faith is that faith must speak. Second Corinthians Corinthians 4.13, um, Paul the Apostle speaking, he says, Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. And then he says, we also believe and therefore speak. All right, so Paul the Apostle is quoting the psalmist from Psalm 116, verse 10 where the psalmist said that he believed and therefore spoke. He believed and therefore spoke. He spoke because he believed. But he just, just, didn't just believe alone. He believed and he spoke. And Paul the apostle says, we have the same spirit of faith. We also believe and therefore speak. So faith speaks. I really need to underscore that. Faith not only believes but faith also speaks. And this is one of the reasons why we have that sheet of confession going on right now during our campaign to ease people and to usher people into the habit of speaking what they believe. I speak my faith every day. There's not a single day where I don't speak my faith. And uh, sometimes just in my daily walk, as you know, I go about business, you know, I speak, I try to weave faith and speak faith into everything. But then purposely, I speak faith. I speak the promises of God over my life because my faith needs to speak in order for it to be operational. Just believing and letting faith sit there by itself, but just believing without speaking will just mean it'll just sit there and not do anything. It is by speaking that the miracle is initiated. All right. So um, anyone that has real Bible faith will say what God says. All right. Anyone that uh, 
has a Bible faith will speak the desired end result. And anyone who doesn't have faith will only speak facts. What are the facts? Oh, could be like people say, oh, I feel symptoms of sickness. So they say, I'm sick. So that's a, that's a fact. And then they look into their bank account. They got no money. They say, I'm poor. They're speaking fact. But you and I, the people of faith, we, yeah, we notice things, but then we walk by faith and not by sight. We don't walk by what our eyes tell us, by, you know, the reports, the natural reports that come to our ears. Our five physical senses are not the ones that determine where we are in life. It is our faith that determines that, and so we speak our faith. You know, God called Abraham a father of many nations long before Abraham had any children at all. And that's our example there. Here we read in Romans chapter 4, verse 16 and verse 17, it says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Here it is. That Abraham is the father of all them that believe. As it is written, verse 17, God says, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. You see, Abraham believed uh, God. And then it says, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. God calls those things that do not exist as though they did. God calls those things that do not exist as though they did. In the life of Abraham, he's Abraham, a childless man. But God called him and said, you are the father of many nations. In fact, not only that, but God says, I have made you, past tense, the father of many nations. And yet if Abraham turned around, looked at his tent, it's empty except Sarah is in there. And so it's an empty tent as far as children are concerned. Looking at Sarah, she is a barren woman. But the Bible says Abraham believed God. So there is, a, there is a truth here that sometimes people have difficulty grasping because they say, how can I call myself prosperous when I've got no money in my bank account? Well, why don't you do this then? Say, I believe that I'm prosperous. People say, how can I call myself healed when I've got sickness in my body? Say, I believe I'm healed. You're confessing your faith. You're not confessing fact. And you want to be careful whom you confess your faith to because if it's the wrong people who are not the people of faith, they will not understand and they will say, you are lying. But we say, no, we are not lying because the Bible tells us that we have been healed past tense, by the stripes of Jesus Christ. So we're only agreeing with God. We're only saying what God says, and we're actually calling those things that do not yet exist as though they did. As I say, if you can grasp a hold of this nugget and this truth, then, then walking by faith will then from that moment be easier for you and be easy because you're suddenly stepping into a realm where you've not been before. And if, and as I say, with all the believing that sometimes people do in their heart, uh, in fact, uh, many people are more in hope than what they are in believing. Uh, do you think that God, uh, you know, God is going to heal? Yeah, yeah, I believe that God will heal me. Will heal is right there is already future tense. Oh, I think God will heal me tomorrow. Then tomorrow comes and then, oh, you think, uh, you, you, you know, you, you receive your healing? Oh, I believe, uh, you know, I think, I hope that I'm going to be healed. So there's more hope there than what there is operating in faith for many, many people. Whereas once we have the revelation, we declare, say, I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus Christ. I'm prosperous. I'm blessed of the Lord. And Pastor Vanessa and I were in Bible college and, and in this church environment there, and on our way to Bible college, we've told the story before. I was driving, 
We had a couple of kids already. We went down on our way from where we lived in the city down to downtown to where our Bible college was operating. And it's said, okay, got all the kids packed in. Yeah, all the kids are here already. Let's go. So I'm driving, and she opens the Bible. says, open the word. And she opens Deuteronomy chapter 28, and we start confessing the first uh, 13 verses where it says that, uh, you know, that if we obey God, which we did, walking in obedience, that we're going to be blessed in the city and, and we're blessed in the field. We are blessed coming in and we are blessed going out, that our basket is blessed, which means our pantry, that our fridge, our freezer is blessed, our storehouse is blessed. Well, that's our bank account. Our storehouse is blessed, that our seed, that ch our children are blessed. And so we confess that every day, every day on the way to Bible college because we learned that our faith must speak. All right, it mu we must open up our mouth and release the words of our faith. So it's anyone who has real Bible faith will do the same. They will start calling those things that are not yet in the natural, but still uh, as though they did exist. Because in the realm of the Spirit, they exist. In the realm of the Spirit, there's more healing sitting there than what you'd ever care to need or, or, or receive. In the realm of the Spirit, there's more provision. There's more finance in the realm of the Spirit. There's all, there's all, everything exists in the realm of the Spirit. It's all there. But it's not until we start speaking that our faith is released and is able to give substance to our hopes and to our dreams. So pillar number one, faith must believe. Pillar number two, Faith must speak. Pillar number three, faith must act. You know, Abraham, when he heard the voice of God speaking to him, says, Abraham, I've made you the father of many nations. In fact, God changed Abraham's name from Abram to Abraham. And here is now not only God speaking and calling Abraham the father of many nations, but when Abraham introduced himself and he met somebody new, he says, hi, my name is Abraham. And of course, we miss things unless we go back into the original language there in Hebrew, and we discover that the word Abraham actually means father of many nations. Hi, I'm the father of many nations. Oh, where are your nations? Oh, I haven't got any yet. Where are your kids? I haven't got any yet, but I'm still. My, my name is Abraham. I'm the father of many nations. You can see what's going on here. All right. He's confessing. Not only, not only did God confess that he was the father of many nations, but he picked up that confession. He started to speak the same thing. And the third pillar in walking of faith is that faith uh, must act. Because we know that Abraham did in the end act. He came together with Sarah, and in the end Sarah came around to it uh, and so forth, and they had a child. Uh, um, so faith must act. James chapter 2, verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You know, James uh, is going through the whole sort of a whole portion of this chapter there. And he says, look, he says, uh, what does it profit if a man says, says he has faith? He, he's saying all the right things, but he's not doing what he says. So faith not only speaks, that's why I said before we started out, we said four pillars. Yes, faith believes, but faith must speak. But, but actually speaking alone is not enough either. You've got to add action into this whole mixture. Because as I say, for a building to be stable, there's typically at least four walls. All right. And if you have a building with just one wall and you can't deliver something out, it's not that stable. You might build a second wall. It gets a bit better, but it's still not a functioning building. How do you know that uh, if somebody were to live in a, in a house that's got four walls and there's a strong southerly and uh, it knocks out the south wall? They're not going to live in that house until that thing is fixed. And, you know, you can't live with a faith that's only got three, two or three walls. You need four walls. You need four pillars uh, to operate uh, in this thing. So faith must act. And the Bible says that faith without works is dead. Works, um, uh, in the NIV, it calls it faith without deeds is dead. In the Weymouth translation, in the New Testament translation of, of that particular version, it says, what good is it, my brethren, if a man professes to have faith 
yet his actions do not correspond. So our words and our actions must correspond. They must align. There's got to be an alignment. And because if I say one thing with the words of my mouth and do something entirely different in my actions, the two don't line up. So what we sometimes encourage people to do when, say, we pray for them for healing, you know, to come into their body where there's sickness and where there's pain and what have you. Say, okay, act as healed as what you can. Do, do the, the best you can and act as healed because it is in acting it out that then, you know, the healing will manifest and will, will um, you know, as it were, you know, come to reality, come into full substance in your life. And Brother Hagen was lying on what he calls his bed of sickness. He was very sick until age 16. Uh, he had two or three incurable diseases. In the end, he ended up having a paralysis in his body, and they were just able to bring in a Bible, you know, bring Grandma's Bible and prop it up in front of him, and he would read the, the Word, and he would, he would kind of, you know, just get into the Word and say, somewhere in here there is an answer. Uh, and in the end, when he realized that he had to not only speak his faith, but act on his faith, he said that he would try to swing his legs over the side of the bed and to start walking. He start crumbling down. Uh, and then they put him back into bed again, and he acted out again, and he crumbled to the ground. And he says, and, and whenever it was, you know, the next time around, and suddenly, as he, as he put his legs down, suddenly strength came into his physical being. The Bible says, uh, and we touched on it last week, when Peter, uh, uh, Paul, uh, the apostle rather, he was at Lystra, he saw a man that was, that was handicapped in his feet from birth. And the Bible says that, that Paul saw that the man had faith to be healed. But he, in the end, he spoke to him, and then he grabbed him by the hand and pulled him up. And as the man started acting his healing, the power of God flowed into his body and began to, to bring the full healing. So one of the best faith actions that you and I can do is to praise God. Thank you, God, that you've healed me. Thank you, Father, that I'm prosperous, that you supply all of my needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, that I'm blessed. But, you know, don't look around at your life and say, well, am I really blessed? No, no, no. You are blessed because the Word says, not because it's already manifest in your life, you see? So you add action into this whole mix, and it is in, in your actions that your faith comes alive. Because you see, faith without works is dead. It's dead faith, it says, as the body without the spirit is dead. You know, I don't mean to be unkind or horrible, but if there were a body lying here on the pet platform, of a dead person, that body has got all the same number of muscles, all the sinews, everything is there except the spirit. And that's why it's called a dead body. And faith without works is like as dead as a dead body. It's there, but it's dead faith. It's not operational. So faith without works is dead. Um, and I'm glad that uh, James... You know, the Lord's half-brother, he isn't beating around the bush. Like, you know, he calls a spade a spade. He just hits, hits it right between the eyes. And it means that I can grab it. I can easily grasp it. You know, if somebody starts hinting around me, oh, I'm not sure what you mean, but if you say what you mean. And James does exactly that. Look, he says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works, without a, a corresponding action is dead. So I am acting out the word of God to the best of my ability. People might say, well, why do you go to church every Sunday? Somebody else might say, oh, because he's the pastor. He's supposed to be at church. But no, I'm here because the Word tells me to be here. He said, why do you, why do you, you know, why do you tithe and why do you give 10% of your income? Because the Word tells me to do that. And it's one thing for me to say, I'm blessed and I'm prosperous, and then rob God of the tithe. So you see, so we tithe. And it's amazing when the blessing of God comes by even giving money away, so to speak, you can increase and you go beyond where other people are going who would have a much higher income and are struggling and can't get it together as far as, uh, 
you know, uh, as far as their, their lifestyle are concerned. So we act out the word um, to the best of our ability. See, our speech must be matched by our deed. We must practice what we preach. That's the third pillar of faith. Um, faith, number one, must believe. Faith, number two, it must speak. And faith, number three, it must act. And here is the fourth pillar, and we're moving quickly now. Fourth pillar is faith must be energized by love. Galatians chapter 5, verse 5 says, For read through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. I'll just focus on the latter uh, part of the second sentence here where it says that faith working through love. You know, when we start to walk by faith and we learn these, these um, components of faith, these pillars, if you like, we give love a high priority in our lives because faith works by love. Uh, Amplified Translation says, Faith is activated and energized and expressed and working through love. You know, many people have mobile phones that they carry around with them. They're not like the old landline phones that you have plugged in and they get their power through being, you know, plugged in. But, but we carry our mobile phones and they've got batteries in them. And our mobile phones operate by electricity. They're energized by electricity. And your faith and my faith is energized by love. And so we give love a high priority in our lives. You know what that does? Is that does, that does away with a, a great deal of the temptation to get into strife, into quarrels with somebody, because as soon as I'm in strife and quarreling with somebody, my faith's no longer properly working because that love energy is not there. And we make love a high priority in our lives. You know, when we started out in this study and we looked uh, at the, um, you know, scripture where Paul the Apostle speaking to the Thessalonian church, he says, he says, your love is growing exceedingly. He says, in fact, he says, your faith is growing exceedingly and your love that you have one for another. He linked faith and love together because love energizes faith. And if love's not there, I mean, faith can be there like, you know, dead faith, but it does not have the energy it needs in order to function. See, I can let my battery run, run out of battery, and it's, it, it's still a phone. It's still got all the, the, the uh, potential there for me to ring my wife and tell her that I love her, or for me to ring my kid or whatever, whoever I end up ringing, but it's not working because there's no energy there's nothing energizing it. And people sometimes that are trying to walk by faith and they don't talk to so-and-so because they upset them. They, they're in strife with so-and-so because something else has happened over here. Some people got strife riddled throughout their whole lives. And they can't walk by faith. All right. So we get strife out of our lives. We get marriage quarrels out of our lives. Yes, we disagree, but we... we work it out in as love would rather than, you know, hip-butting uh, and so forth. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we make up with our brother and sisters. If something's gone down, we say, look, let uh, forgive you, you know, just let it go. And uh, sorry for what I said. And, you know, we, we start to walk by love because walking by faith also means walking in love. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, it says, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, and be patient. All right? So it says, he must not quarrel. Faith, number one, must believe. Faith, number two, must what? Must speak. Faith, number three, must act. And faith, number four, must be energized by love, and they must not quarrel. All right, they must not quarrel. These are not suggestions. These are definite spiritual laws. 
They're not like, well, it would be good if you didn't, or you try a bit of this. You know, I said, I'm not so much talking about a formula of faith, because people have tried formulas. And in the first instance, strong faith flows out of a strong relationship with Jesus Christ. But there's multiple facets to this thing uh, where we need to have strong relationships with one another and walk in love. And then finally, final scripture here in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. It says, therefore, is the elect of God, that, that's us, born again believers, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, bearing with one another, verse 13, bearing with one another. So it means that, you know, we need to learn to put up. Some people are a bit quirky, a bit funny, a bit different. We need to put up with that. Uh, and then it goes on to say here, and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. You know that? I remember um, a minister friend of, of ours came um, many years ago to our church, and he talked about the divine musts. There are certain things that we must do. There are certain things that are optional, but there's certain things that we must do. And in order for us to walk by faith, these are the things that we must do. We no longer negotiate with ourselves and say, oh, yeah, I can do a bit of this and then a bit of that. We no longer negotiate with the devil. Uh, we get him out of our lives. Uh, we no longer give way to the flesh and let the flesh rip and, and, and so forth. And I tell myself, uh, watch your mouth. I tell myself, watch your mouth. Um, because we did our, we did, it's with our mouth that we sin. You know, the Bible says, if any man has got his mouth under control and he walks in love, there's no more sin in his life. So make love your high priority and get strife out of your marriage, get it out of your family, get it out. And if people insist on carrying on striving, you know, some, there's families that are just riddled with, riddled with strife. You just pull back a little bit to say, uh, create a bit of space. Uh, between yourself and the strife, um, and that sometimes helps. Uh, and in some instances, it's physical space, and in other instances, it's just a bit of emotional space just to, to get away from people that are constantly wanting to engage in a battle with you. Uh, forgive them and move on. And if they said unkind things and they haven't said sorry, forget it anyway. Don't wait for somebody to say, say sorry. Just forgive them because God's called us to forgive whether somebody said sorry or not, because you're walking by faith, you can no longer afford to engage in strife and in quarrels. Verse 14, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. If you want to be perfect, the love walk will, uh, is called the, the, the bond of perfection. Thanks for watching Victory Christian Center. For more content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Or you can subscribe to our podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, or Google Podcasts. Check out our website at victory.net.nz. We'll see you again soon.